Right, welcome everybody uh, to the Future South webinar. Um, I think we might have a few more people popping in, but um, we're a couple of minutes past 11. So if we get kicking off, we can make the most of our hour together. Um, yeah, I'm really pleased to welcome Caroline Carlin from Southampton Football Club today to talk about um, the sustainability journey that they've been making. And I was just going to kind of set the scene a little bit around sport and how sport has actually become a significant player in this sustainability space and certainly in the low carbon space um, and is definitely gaining momentum in year, recent years. And whilst there's a kind of global movement now, I started in the world of sport and sustainability at the, at the RYA, the Royal Yachting Association, which is the UK's national governing body for sport. Um, over 20 years ago, I was their environmental manager and <clears throat> it was really to push Good environmental practice with the users and and work closely with the industry and we were a sort of leading governing body and you know we now see that some of those athletes and the most successful female sailor hannah mills and and ben ainsley in in the male area have been pushing the sustainability agenda so what's great is that the south isn't actually that new to this sport movement and has been actually at the forefront of a lot of um sport and sustainability and one of the leading international federations actually was world sailing uh, which used to be based in in southampton as well and i think the key thing now is that the un has recognized sport as a significant industry to drive this low carbon agenda and over 250 sports organizations globally are now signatories of what has become the sport for climate action framework and that will be represented in november at, at cop 26 and sports and are bringing on their athletes are really trying to drive this agenda forward. And whilst I might say football is following sailing in some places, I think they're absolutely charging ahead now with a much bigger following and, and, a, and a huge potential to impact. And, you know, I, I contacted uh, Southampton a few years back and we're told, and just been talking to Caroline about this, that some of our staff are interested, you know, because obviously as a, as a local uh, organization was keen to see what what saints were doing and um i'm so pleased to see now that caroline who's been there for three years started off in operations and compliance and and three months ago became their operations and sustainability manager um and so having that recognition of sustainability adding to her responsibilities really shows where they've come in the past few years and um, I think that's testament to Caroline and the work she's been doing there, but also to the to the club and, and where they're going with this. And they developed and, and published their strategy, the halo effect in January this year. So I'm going to welcome Caroline, who will tell us what she's been doing, um, what the club's doing and the aspirations that they have going forward. And if we can um, if we can put some questions in the chat, then we'll pick those up. If, if we can pick some of those up during the presentation, great. Otherwise, we will uh, pick all of them up, at, well, as many as we can up at the end of, at the, end of the session. So, Caroline, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks, Susie. What an introduction. Hope I can live up to that. Um, it's really great to be here to talk to you all today about Southampton Football Club's journey to the halo effect. And I appreciate that journey is a widely used term and some, somewhat cliched, but I really think it does well describe um, what we've been doing in the past couple of years. Um, I'm going to just share some slides with you and Susie, feel free to jump in if any questions come through throughout. So bear with me a second. Okay, let me just get this down. Okay. All right, oh, let me go backwards. Right, can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the halo effect, the journey so far. Um, we, I've got a little subheading there of are you being ambitious enough? And actually, that sort of question was asked by Susie, among others that we spoke to on this journey. And so I'll take you kind of back to the beginning, really, with um, where we started off. In 2019, the club's approach, um, you know, we had some good intentions. There was pockets of work going on 
around the organization across our sites. And as Susie mentioned, they're de definitely where staff really interested in this space and wanting to make a difference already. What we didn't have though was a definitive plan in place, a strategic approach um, underpinned by a, a strategy that we put out publicly to say what we were doing. So there was no real accountability or ownership of that. But, but as I say, there were some, some really good pockets of work and that included things like a staff sustainability forum. We were trialing meat free Mondays at the stadium for our staff. Um, there was a pass and plastic initiative that I was heavily involved in linked with Sky uh, Ocean Rescue and the Premier League. And some of you that might come to the stadium will see reusable cups being used in the concourses. That's as part of that initiative. And at Staple Training Ground, we'd put in 14 um, hydration stations and, and issued, as you'll see in the top picture there, um, reusable bottles for all staff and players so that we could, again, reduce single use plastic. Um, our grounds team had some electric mowers, pedestrianised mowers um, already in use. And, um, and at the moment, there's some fantastic ride on mowers that have been trialled that we're looking to to take on in the coming months. Um, we were working on our environmental compliance and we'd already switched across to renewable energy. So as I say, there was some work going on, but nothing that we could really uh, collect loads of data on and really report back and say, this is, this is what Southampton are doing in sustainability space. And on the back of that, um, when Sport Positive <laughs> did a league table of, on the Premier League and looking at, as you can see there, these categories of clean energy and energy efficiency, sustainable transport and reduction of single use plastics, looking at the waste management procedures in place at the clubs, water efficiency, the way that we were managing using plant-based or low carbon food options. And of course, um, a really key one for sports, the communications and engagement around sustainability and, and what your club stood for. And because we didn't have that strategic approach, we, we scored really poorly actually and, and, beca and became 18th place, um, I'm sorry to say. At that point, we really re recognised um, we'd been slightly named and shamed um, and no one wants to be at the bottom of any league table. But we really just had to get our heads together and, and, and work on what we were going to do going forward from there. So we looked at our existing approach and, and we, we basically created a sustainability leadership group. And a key thing for us that gave the group momentum was that this was headed up by two members of the board of directors. We have the chief legal and risk officer, Tim Greenwell, and we have our commercial director, David Thomas. And by sitting on the board of directors, this, this enables us to have the weight behind anything we do in this space going forward to be able to make decisions, to empower the club, to embed sustainability within the whole organization and, and to really make a difference. Um, initially, we embarked on signing up to the Green City Charter from Southampton City Council, and that was really pledging as a founding signatory that uh, their net zero ambitions, that we would be an active part of, of the changes necessary to reach that target. And we decided to start building a new network. People like Susie and many others have been a key part of that where we've, we've actually had fantastic support so far in this journey, because actually in sustainability, we all want the same thing. And certainly anyone who's based in Southampton would really want to see Southampton Football Club leading the way in this space. And developing sustainability partnerships. I'll touch on that a bit more later on. We initially put together a, a strategy template, and this was based on some initial feedback um, and looking at what we were doing and what we thought we could do. And I must admit that in that first instance was very green. What are we going to do with recycling? What are we going to do with energy? And we, we started sharing that out with some trusted uh, people in our networks, including Susie. And the, the first initial feedback that was coming back to us takes me back to my initial comment about are you being an, ambitious enough? We were really challenged. You know, we, we spoke to Virgin Media who are doing excellent work in sustainability. And they were saying, you have this huge platform. Are you being ambitious enough? Susie said the same. You know, I think you could go bigger than this. You know, yes, absolutely. You must make a difference on the carbon agenda. You must make a difference for the environment. But also this is about people and planet. And we were already doing some, we already are doing fantastic work through Saints Foundation in our social um, responsibility, but actually capturing a holistic approach to sustainability was where we needed to be in order to achieve um, maximum potential in sustainability. 
So on that basis, I'll introduce you to the halo effect. There's a small video here. Hopefully you'll hear the sound. <laughs> so just breaking down the four quadrants of the strategy there, as you can see, we have the environmental, corporate, social and fan responsibility. And we launched this in January 2021 to amazing feedback and loads of interest and everything that we could have hoped for, really, with the feedback that we've received so far. Our fans really proud of what we're what we're putting out um, publicly as a real commitment. Um, and wanting to back that up with real action. So if I just take you through in a little bit more detail, within each, within each um, quadrant of the strategy, we have some core segments. And I actually coordinate the environmental uh, quadrant of the strategy, which for us, we have key performance indicators in between uh, waste management, energy, water, and other resource use and biodiversity, a massive part of it is education and engagement for us as well. We'll talk you through some things we've done in this space. But as you can see, and I'm happy to share these slides afterwards if anyone wants, wants them, um, we've broken down each of our quadrants into key performance indicators. And each quadrant has owners, and these are across our organization, so that this isn't just sitting with one person in one department. This is how we're embedding sustainability throughout the whole organization. We've delivered training across procurement, across HR, across our comms teams, water relations team. Our sustainability leadership group has got wider. We're taking on green champions. And we're just making sure that in all of our business decisions and processes, sustainability is at the heart of it. It's a consideration at the start. It's not an add-on later. It's not an afterthought. It's not a, well, we sh should have maybe done this. We're now considering it officially as part of our decision-making processes in all of these areas. In each of the quadrants, we have a hero halo initiative. So in the environmental responsibility, we have an initiative called the Homegrown Project. And that is where we plant 250 trees locally in Southampton and preserve another 250 in the Amazon region. Every time one of our academy players makes a debut for the first team, which is a huge part of the Southampton way. Anyone who's a Southampton fan will have heard that terminology, I'm sure. And our Southampton Academy is producing fantastic players that go on to perform for our first team. We're super proud of that. And by actually making this commitment to plant these trees, it's creating a legacy in Southampton. We've already planted 1,250, some of those at Staplewood, furthering our biodiversity work there, but 1,000 of them at Redbridge School. Redbridge School is also a community champion school for Saints Foundation. And we also delivered an education piece when we did the planting with some of the children from the school talking about the benefits of trees to the environment and biodiversity. So this is just a real link up between everything that we're working on back to our environmental responsibility. 
There is a carbon offsetting element to the preservation of trees abroad and the ones that we've preserved in the Amazon we've received carbon credits for. But the heart of the Home Grown Initiative is the planting in Southampton. That's really important to us um, going forward as well. Within the, within, uh, the, we have the Positive Impact Pledge there, which supports small startups and entrepreneurs uh, with a tax-free grant of £1,000. The Saints is one, most of you, well, you may have heard about this, fantastic work through the Saints Foundation, certainly during the COVID pandemic, which has been obviously really taxing times for so many in the city. And that's involved distributing meals, delivering prescriptions, and taking phone calls and making phone calls to some of our season ticket holders who might be experiencing social isolation. So a massive, massive um, positive impact on the city. And the Saints Supporter Charter is an ongoing piece of work to make sure that we're treating our fans fairly uh, in everything that we're doing and that they're considered at the heart of our business decisions that affect our fans. As I mentioned earlier, a network within sustainability uh, within the Halo Effect has been crucial. And these are some of the uh, supporters and, and people that we've take, carried out projects with so far. With the Southern Sustainability Partnership at the top right hand corner, you may have seen advertised that Southampton Football Club are hosting um, the host venue for the Big Sustainability Expo for the first time uh, in history. We're going to be holding that there for the next three years at least. So we're super excited for that. That is actually next month and you can sign up for that on the Southern Sustainability Partnerships website. Some of the um, areas that we've made improvements on, some small, some larger, and some are works in progress, are things such as LED, LED upgrades across both our sites. With a 20 plus year old stadium, you can probably imagine we're not fully kitted out as LED, but actually it's more sustainable for us to do these upgrades in a really planned way, rather than rip out all of our lighting, some of which has a, a good life, life cycle left on it. And so we're doing significant upgrade projects across both sites for that. There's loads of work going on at Staplewood with regards to biodiversity. Really, really exciting to see that developing. And that's including leaving our hedgerows to grow wild, our grasses to grow wild. If they're not being played on, if it's not a pitch, it's being left to grow. We've also got um, lots of log pile houses as well and some wildflower areas. So beautiful biodiversity going on there. We're, we're announcing at the moment, actually, you'll see that very, very soon that we've become ambassadors for the Team Wilder campaign for the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. So you'll see some information in, the, in, the, uh, in our social content soon on that. We've carried out staff travel surveys and staff training um, through BASIS, which is the British Association for Sustainable Sport, and through our Carbon Footprint Project, which we worked with the University of Southampton on, which was fantastic. We completed that um, earlier this year. We have signed up, as Susie mentioned, to the Sport for Climate Action um, Framework with the UNFCCC. And also we're promoting staff cycling initiatives like bike doctor sessions, um, cycle confidence classes and cycle to work schemes. We've just recently launched our away kit, which was a live beach clean. And the away shirts are made from recycled plastic bottles. And a huge step for us to make such a public announcement about our commitments with the halo effect with the kit launch and in partnership with Hummel as a new kit provider who have a fantastic work in sustainability and we're totally in alignment with them. We've been doing staff beach cleans and also uh, player beach cleans. We have more to come on litter picking and things in the community. Battery recycling, switch off reminders, all of these things are the small steps that any organization can take. We've got electric vehicle charging points, not many at the moment, but a plan in place over the next few months to install another 16 at Stapewood and several more at the stadium. We're working to donate kit and equipment to the Kit Out the Nation BBC initiative at the moment. And we've also signed up to Planet Super League, which the Foundation and Southampton Football Club are supporting, um, which you'll see a lot more communication on at the moment. And that Planet Super League initiative at the moment is called CUP26 in the lead up to COP26. So we're delighted to be supporting that initiative. We've been donating furniture um, to other organisations and schools. We've also been sending furniture for recycle, so responsible um, waste management with old furniture that we have upgraded since. We've also um, been doing lots of reuse initiatives. So for example, reupholstering um, furnishings at Staplewood instead of buying new, and that's using a local business to do that. So it's a change of culture and a change of 
uh, how we do things. You'll see that we've um, taken on new bins and wrapped our bins with halo effect um, branding just to really remind fans on a match day to, to be um, separating their waste as much as possible so it supports our zero to landfill waste management processes. And we've also got, I think it actually was on the previous page, you'll see an image there of the reusable cut bins. We've done the same on that. Um, we've also just booked some education sessions for our academy players. So, so at Staplewood campus, uh, the scholars, which is our over, uh, under 16s plus, um, they have education sessions there. And as part of their life skills curriculum, they upcoming have a climate change session, a plastics in the ocean and ocean health session, and also a biodiversity session with some of the supporters that I've mentioned um, earlier on. I'm really delighted to say that after the launch of the Halo Effect and the work that we've done so far, we've achieved reaching sixth place on the Support Positive League table. And obviously we've got ambitions to even reach higher than that. But it's just, it's just been really delightful for the club to see that if you take a strategic approach, you take these measured actions, you embed sustainability across your organisation, you can really then have measured progress where, where you have results like this. So we're absolutely delighted with that. And that's my slides. <laughs> so absolutely open to any questions, Susie, if anyone would like to know more about anything I've talked about today. Perfect. Thank you, Caroline. I'll have to unmute myself before. Um, it, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, please add them to the to the chat box. But whilst everyone hopefully or people are hopefully typing a few questions in there, I can uh, I can kick off. Obviously, always got lots to ask. <laughs> I think one of, I mean, one of the key, you mentioned it as well, like, are you being ambitious enough? And, you know, the, the, there's a massive famous quote about from Nelson Mandela, isn't there, about sport has the power to change the world and the power to unite. And, you know, and I think that's, uh, for me, has always been the big driver, because it's very easy to say, well, the most sustainable thing is not to run some of these major events or some of this, um, you know, clubs and, and thousands of people, you know, travel to, to these events and, you know, the stadium fills up and there's, there's consumption and all of that kind of stuff. But um, I think going back to that, you know, are you being ambitious enough? Do you see Southampton, the football club, and do you see sport as kind of playing a massive role in this space? I mean, do you think it, it plays a different role to other businesses? Um, and, um, and I guess, what do you see the role that, that the football club could pay, play to drive, you know, obviously Future South would, you know, our mission is to drive the low carbon agenda. Do you see a role for the club in, in driving that agenda, you know, locally, but also um, you have a bigger remit as well? Or a... Yes, I do. <laughs> Absolutely, totally agree with everything you've just said. We have a huge role to play. We have so many pairs of eyes on us whether that be fans, our staff, our players, the young players coming through the academy, other organisations in our city and worldwide um, and nationally who are watching what we're doing, other sporting organisations, for example, within Basis, who we're members of, you know, there's, there's all sorts of sporting organisations on there. And ultimately, if you've got stadiums and you've got matches or events on, um, you know, many of our challenges will be the same. Um, when we did our carbon footprint research project through the University of Southampton, it was very, very clear to us that a big, um, a big part of our footprint is travel to the stadium, band travel, player travel, staff travel, some unavoidable, some avoidable. Um, and we have a lot of work to do in that space. And we're working with a, a consultancy now to entirely uh, review our match day travel plan. It's a really key um, step in the right direction for us to look at that. And even just moving with the times a bit and just seeing, you know, the, the, the progress that's been made with the voice scooters, for example. Well, at the end of the road that the stadium is on, there's a voice scooter bank. So we need to be really being proactive in, you know, advising our fans about other ways. You know, yes, you might have been coming to the stadium for 20 years in this way. But let's rethink that because the club are committed to this. But ultimately, there's loads of positives to bringing this many people to the city. But yes, of course, if we're bringing lots of traffic to the city, there's there's definitely environmental challenges with that. So uh, I think COVID threw up some challenges because we we certainly were looking at really promoting lift sharing and things. And, and then, of course, it's try and keep everyone apart. So it, there's been some challenges. I think um, we just need to be really transparent about understanding 
um, where some things are, are unavoidable. And that for us is why I touched a little bit on there's an element of offsetting with some of the work we've done, but absolutely we are making sure that we've worked on everything else before we fall back on offsetting. But because we understand that certainly for our players travel, there will be unavoidable emissions from that but we will do whatever we can to really eliminate and reduce wherever possible. So say, for example, we have a corporate fleet of vehicles. We've already changed across to eight of them so far into electric versions, which is why we're increasing our electric charging points at the, at the, uh, at the sites. So those steps will make a big difference there. We've also, through COVID, as everyone has, we've experienced a working from home change of, change of way of working. And, and on the back of that, our, our working from home policy has changed and uh, staff have the option to combine their working week with working on site and working at home. And there's that trust and, and understanding that everyone can fulfill their role well. Many people at the, at the club can fulfill their role perfectly well from home. And so from that side of things, there's going to be a change in the data that we see when we next measure, for example, our staff, tra staff travel survey in comparison to the ones that we carried out before COVID. Um, we'll see those differences there. But yeah, absolutely, in answer to your question, the responsibility of sport is huge. We need to really harness that and use that for good. Um, already young people are so much more aware and, and, and across this and, and having education in this space. But there's, I think, gaps um, that we can, uh, we can fill with, with the messaging that we're putting out, being really responsible in that way. Yeah. And uh, our chairman, future South chairman, Ben Earl, has uh, asked a question back on travel. So Brighton provide free travel public transport tickets. Is that something that you're looking at or would look at for the fan yes. travel? Absolutely. And as part of the match day travel plan, um, those things will be considered. We've already engaged in conversations with the bus providers on this. So really and truly watch this space on that. And um, yes, I'd, I'd love to push something along those lines. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And there's a, uh, another question we've got on water and water consumption. Um, do you have initiatives reducing your water consumption and especially regarding irrigation of, of the pitch? It's a water's bigger issue, isn't it? Coming on. Yeah, it's a really good question and actually um, and, and good timing as well, because uh, as I've mentioned, the University of Southampton uh, research project, now we've done the carbon footprint within 2020 to 2021. Our next project with them starting in the next few weeks is actually about water consumption and the options for water uh, preservation and recycling and reuse. There's some challenges with that, but certainly it's an area we're really keen to, to delve more on. Um, I think it's something we can make a bigger difference in at the, at the staple training ground than at the stadium. Um, there's, there's, there's different challenges for that. But um, over the coming months, as we delve deeper into to water, because that is definitely a a, a, a one that we haven't been able to do as much in that space yet but uh, this research project is going to be massively helpful for us to start taking some steps um, with that but ultimately I think for us our building management systems and making sure that we are managing our water use and making sure we're maintaining our water outlets as well because obviously you could be losing quite a lot of water if you don't manage your, your system as well so that, that our first step was to make sure that we are we are well ahead of any managing any leaks and things like that in the first instance, but then we're going to go deeper into looking at water reuse uh, for pitches, certainly. Perfect. Um, and another question here moving on from that is around partnerships. So I'll read the question out. With partnerships and the agreements which exist, do you feel clubs should start first with local partners and environmental based groups or start with signing larger agreements to kick off the work and to signal to others your commitments? And can you also share what happens after you or another entity becomes a UNFCC signatory? Thanks for the informative presentation. Maybe start with the one around partners and the local versus um, the larger agreements. Uh, well, the, the, the great thing is since we've been, um, we've been working on the halo effect, our partnerships team have been included in the sustainability leadership groups and have been across all conversations from the outset they understand and, uh, and feel empowered to have the right conversations at the right times with potential partners and existing partners. Because I think for all organizations, your teams need to come from a place of knowledge and confidence in what they're talking about. So when they're looking to onboard a new partner, 
we know what we're looking for. Um, so I think it's important to, to, to give them the information and the training, which is why they've been involved in, in those as well. Um, we have definitely been looking to onboard more local partners um, and local suppliers as well. So even from a supply chain point of view, that, that's definitely our remit is to look very locally, but the procurement process and supply chain process, they, they cover that within that process there. Um, it's a difficult one to answer because I don't work in partnerships and, uh, and I, I think they would probably give you a much more detailed response, but certainly I think that there's a combination of both. If you were to look at who our partners are, there's a combination of local and wider. And I suppose it depends what the intentions are with that partnership and the activations they want and how much involvement there is, I guess, whether it's player facing or quite um, behind the scenes. Um, so yeah, and in answer to, to your question, I probably can't give as accurate an answer as you are looking for without speaking see, to the partnership if I, team. If I pick up a little bit on that, though, do you see partners as, um, and we can get onto suppliers and supply chain in a bit, but do you see partners as uh, key to your kind of scalability of your message? And maybe, you know, initially you've been focused very much internally getting your house in order and getting all of these initiatives that you've gone through, but actually those, those partnerships, and there's probably two bits to my question. The first one is, uh, picks up on, well, let's just cover the scalability piece because partners will have that ability and a different voice, won't they, to help you deliver your message and really get that out there. And are you are you driving as this you know lead in sustainability to say actually hold on these guys can really help me get my message out there and then proactively kind of pushing your partnerships team to say how yeah. can they help us? What could they do with us to absolutely you know, on, on the different aspects? Absolutely. And I meet with the partnerships team on a monthly basis. So we have these conversations, what's coming up, what's our next, what are we pushing on? What do, and I keep them updated on things they should be telling partners about so that the partners feel they are, you know, you know they, they fully understand what the club's doing in this space and any opportunities to work together. And a really good example, I think, is the, the, the new kit partner with Hummel. Um, who have you know great intentions to be the most sustainable sports brand in the world, and uh, just their early the, the 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 kit launch for our away kit was such a statement by the club and by Hummel to say we both mean business here. You know we're making kits from reused recycled plastics, and we are going to do it live from a beach doing a beach clean with Final Straw Foundation, who we work with on our beach cleans, to make a real statement that behaviorally we're making changes. We, we did that locally, that was at Leap Beach. Uh, no, no, yeah, it was at Leap Beach. And we are basically looking to say, everything we're doing in partnership with Hummel is always got sustainability at the heart of it because it's a key driver for them. It's a key driver for us. And that's that has been a real turning point for partnerships, I feel, to look for the same in all partners going forward. And even the conversations we're having with providers of, of, of um, products that we buy you know it, those sorts of changes in the way that we communicate with partners and with suppliers has enabled us to speak to us we might say to someone we still want to use and use a provider for this but we don't want to receive it wrapped in loads of plastic going forward you know we need to find a better way and it's kind of I guess using being a bit more brave about having that conversation because that's we're not going to achieve what we're saying we're trying to achieve if we continue to accept that so it's saying, it's saying to someone, this is really important to us. And we've actually given that feedback to providers recently. And, and they've said, you're absolutely right. And we're working on this. And this is what we're going to do about it. And I think the more pressure organizations can put in that space, um, the more that you will trigger change. Because I think ultimately that's what's helped change us. We, we felt more under pressure. We wanted to do the right thing and we wanted to make change. But I think... The catalyst was becoming 18th in that league table I showed you. And that pressure made us go, right, we're doing something about this. And I think that's going to be the same throughout. And I think that's what's going to happen after COP26 as well, is that people will be pushed to say, right, we've been talking about this for a long time. And now we need to properly just get on with it. Let's do it. And do you, second part of my conversation, and uh, this I think is one of the hardest things in sport is, do you think that your commercial, your partnerships team are uh, now engaged enough and confident enough and see the bigger opportunity that I think we as sustainability professionals see and hope is the, 
is the future, but actually they uh, they might just take the money. Ooh. <laughs> and it might not always be, you said about the right partners and, you know, we, we see it in sport the whole time. You know, what? Our, our commercial partnerships team are absolutely really actually personally very interested in sustainability i think i think we're fortunate so i think with regards to southampton football club yes sustainability is at the heart because thankfully the people in that department are actually personally interested and they really want they really want to be part of the journey as well so i think we've done we've done well there because i think it would be more challenging for us to for me to confidently say that to you if they didn't care as much that's probably I think one of the main, yeah. main questions. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but I, you know, one of my colleagues who works in commercial partnerships contacts me all the time and shares podcasts and things that he's listening to in his own personal time that are about, for example, um, emergency on planet sport. You know, we'll be saying, oh, have you heard this one? Have you listened to this one? And that is really great to have people in the organisation in positions where change is happening but that actually yeah. in their personal their personal life they really care about sustainability too because it just makes makes things a lot easier to see change yeah perfect so the, the next part of that question um put up there by uh, marissa was around um what happens when you sign the unfcc so you become part of sport for climate action mm -hmm. so i i can answer a little bit of that because from the sport for climate action i've been co-chairing one of the working groups and it's a collaborative effort of all of these sports organizations to really try and come up with a common framework of measuring and what should be within scopes and how extensive and how fast that should be and what sports should take together and and one of you know what the outcome of that is to align to paris and to align to those climate goals um all based on science uh, and so that's a, a 45 percent absolute reduction by 2030 and to become net zero by 2050 those are the extensive goals obviously sport everyone wants to be the top of the league table which is the great thing about sport and actually if we wait to 2050 we'll we'll never get there so that's from the sport for climate action i mean caroline what's it meant for you guys to be part of that that framework and are you involved in cop and are you doing activations around, you know, COP's obviously in Glasgow, it's not that far away, first of, um, right at the beginning of, of November. There um, are um, initiatives aren't happening with Sport for yeah. Climate Action. Yeah. And certainly I think the, with the Sport for Climate Action and us talking about that, and then and, and just, I guess, signposting our fans and everyone reading what we're doing um, towards that and, and using that as an education piece, really, so keeping that in, on, on the agenda. And also with the Cup 26 with Planet Super League that I've mentioned, that again enables us, I mean, it's daft, but we'll even have posters on toilet doors, you know, so we're trying to get our fans to sign up to it. They'll be scoring goals for Southampton Football Club by taking sustainable, sustainable actions in their own lives so our fans can actively be involved in, in, in the commitments we're making. Um, and that's in the build-up to COP26. So it enables us to talk about COP26 and, and use our platform to promote it and keep it as a conversation, but also with something like COP26 enables it to be linked to our business and what we are, which is football. And ultimately you have to make sure that the content that you're putting out is relevant and the, the fans won't just go, oh, they're still talking about this. You know, we really need to keep them interested in, in what we're doing. And there will be some people that are really really avidly interested in sustainability, but we've got to get that balance right where we're communicating what we're doing, why we're doing it, and why it's important, but to have the relevance with football, because obviously that's ultimately what we are and what we do. Um, so the, the CUP26 initiative from Planet Super League has been really important in that. Um, I also think since we've signed up to it, the key thing has been the opportunity to give our feedback and our input and to take part in some of the, the, the chaired meetings that you mentioned there. Um, and for me, I definitely, and, and I feel this with basis, um, is that collaborative approach of sporting organisations towards a shared goal is, um, is really encouraging because I feel that there's a lot more weight behind the movement when you have that momentum of all these organisations and great minds and great experiences all coming together to achieve something. Um, because we could be doing really great work over here, but if the next five clubs along aren't doing anything or not very much, it's going to be really difficult for our impact to be felt. But imagine if we were all doing this, gosh, what a difference we'd make and the reach that we would have. 
Um, and that's why things like the Pass on Plastic Initiative were great because all the clubs bought into that and all the clubs got involved and, and were talking about it and supported by obviously the Sky Ocean Rescue. And, and at the time there was so much in the, just in the social awareness around plastics in the ocean through the Blue Planet series and, and so on and so forth. So it made a lot of sense for us to all be doing that together, but we should be a lot more ambitious about joining together as a club. So for example, myself and Mike from uh, Arsenal, we, 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 we've been saying for ages and, and the Premier League have been great um, by saying, you know, we want a working group of all the sustainability kind of reps within within each club to come together so we can work together on shared initiatives. And that is a work in progress, but certainly there are key people at certain clubs who are already really saying there's a real appetite to work together. So I think the UNFCCC is that on a much wider scale because it's all sports, all, all organizations um, coming together. So there's, there's, it's really exciting. And picking on that, up on that bit, like the Pass on Plastics into the Sky Initiative, obviously Sky just done their net zero match, haven't they? And is that something that you guys would be, actually that's a collaborative thing that could be rolled out across the whole of the Premier League. What if we all then ran net zero games and get the broadcasters? Because fundamentally, if we can get the broadcasters engaged, we've got a much bigger uh, opportunity haven't we with the voice they're the, they're yeah. the kind of key to the key to the message aren't they massively and you'll have seen a real shift in for example sky sports news uh, you've got david at sky, sky sports news talking so much about sustainability and sustainability in sport and the impacts um uh, you know that sport can have in the space so i already think there's a movement towards introducing talking about climate and talking about sustainability in general within a sporting environment a broadcast so yeah definitely i'd be really keen for all clubs to start taking part in um trialing and then rolling out net zero uh, matches and events but i think that you've got to remember the clubs are at different levels with their kind of financials and and the ability to make some of the changes necessary to get to that point so i think there, there would need to be kind of a measured accepted approach that some people might take longer to reach that point than others because of perhaps their financial position and i will get back to the questions but on on that one how about athletes how have you engaged your athletes in in do you have any who are real champions for the cause or yes. have you got a program to really kind of actually almost upskill them isn't it make them feel comfortable in this space that they can talk confidently about what's happening yeah, absolutely. And we've got some that are, they're already in, in, in that place. So players like Oriol Romeo, he, he talks very confidently about this and is really keen. You know, we've got Theo Walcott, who by his own choice drives an electric vehicle and, and, and they're very much more aware of kind of where their food is coming from. And, you know, we, we, we're we seeing a real shift in culture from the players coming through anyway, that it's much more on their awareness. And actually, when I talk about the education sessions for our scholars, that's because we see that in order to have a team of first team players who are environmentally aware, it starts with your young players. So by doing these education with our young players now, wherever they end up in their career as, as senior players, they now have this basic awareness for them to then grow on it going forward. But certainly we're, 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 they're the ones that are driving getting more electric charging points as well. You know, this is a bigger project for us than just putting a couple of extras in, you know, one by one, including Ralph, driving an electric vehicle, fully electric vehicle. This is, they're passionate about it. They want to see it more. And um, we're just putting in um, a water refill point at the edge of a pitch to enable them to, to, to reduce their single use plastic use even further. Because as much as we've made huge steps in that, in that space, there still was elements of single use kind of when it came to traveling and training. And actually they're, they're so on board now. And certainly since the halo effect has been, been such a successful, um, uh, launch um, by putting in this pitch side water refill point it means that they would have their Hummel water bottle go out to training and if they need a refill they'd be using the Hummel water bottle again they wouldn't be reaching for single use so it's, it's, it's those small infrastructure changes that enable us to continue with that commitment that we've made. Um, so back to um, back to the questions and another one here um, how do you manage these huge sustainability issues around data management and tracking progress essentially and how do you keep on top and report on 
all of the data that you've got to be measuring to get to, you know, we come up with one number, don't we, for carbon footprint, but there's a whole series of data and information that you've had to kind of collate. So how, how are you how are you staying on top of all of that across your sustainability KPIs? Uh, very difficult. <laughs> um, we've actually been, we've engaged with um, someone within our IT team who's set up a fantastic uh, portal for us to store this data. So we have one place. Uh, you know, and I'll be t totally transparent here. When we were doing our, our carbon footprint research project, the hardest thing that Jake, who we worked with, came across was being able to access data. Data was stored in all sorts of different departments, and people had information about travel over there, and then this department had travel about this team, and there was information about utility bills over there. And it was an, it just because we hadn't been collating it together in a strategic way for use in this in this way to analyze for this purpose we were just storing it i guess you, as you do you store utility with fulfillment and so on it just we hadn't had it in one place but uh, alongside some changes that we're making within our operations management anyway our data going forward will all be in one one space so at the moment that we've done that for our utilities but there's still work to be done on travel travel is the one for us because as a as a football club, it's not just there's not just one pocket of travel. There's pockets of travel everywhere. <laughs> we have our younger players, our uh, our girls team, our women's team, our academy teams. We've got staff travel. We've just got so much um, to to try and capture all in one space. So we're still a work in progress. So I would say it's been difficult, but uh, we're going to get there. Oh, so someone's just popped in a, a new comment, Stacey. Uh, our IoT will sort out your data issues. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. So um, going back, so in the halo effect, another question here from, from Mohammed. In the halo effect, you mentioned that you plant 250 trees for every academy player debut. Wouldn't it be more effective if the club planted trees for every league win? Um, because during the season, the team registers more wins than the academy debuts in general. Interested in knowing your opinion. And I, I guess maybe that links to and, and simon has also added a question here based on your carbon footprint are you able to share the largest direct and indirect emitters um and the biggest challenges in carbon so wrapping that into your kind of carbon now you understand the carbon um and signatory of sport for climate action i mean one of those pieces is to to aim to be net zero in the end is 250 trees enough or how does that all kind of together yes you're right and you know we we gauged it on around three to four player um debuts per season and we'd obviously be doing the planting and the preserving of trees and that was our initial thoughts and we hadn't you know ruled out any other plantings for anything else as we see fit we've also made sure that we've now included uh, the same for our women's team so if any of our uh, regional talent uh, group young female players debuts for the female first team women's first team we would also be planting the same number so it's across both our teams now so we now expect that to be more trees uh, than initially uh, planned um we hadn't thought to do it with league wins we were specifically wanting to join this up with academy it was it felt right for us to have homegrown and to really link it into the the growth of talent and development of talent to, to kind of the legacy we're leaving in the city. So that, that was our considerations for that. And we haven't ruled out other offsetting opportunities as well. But I think well, when we first created the Homegrown Initiative, we were still in the process of, of analyzing our carbon footprint. We didn't have that data captured before and, and, uh, and analyzed in that way. So it was, it was an open book for us. And that is enabling us to have a fluid, um, work in progress approach to the halo effect so now we have that information in fact this afternoon is our next um halo effect steering group meeting so that's when we look at it and look at the quadrants look at the segments look at our key performance indicators and say are we putting our focus in the right direction here or as we know more and learn more and do more do we need to redirect our attention so uh, in answer to your question there's 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 definitely more we can do we understand more about our main carbon um, emissions as I mentioned you know very much for us it's about travel um, everything else we've really done a lot of work in that space and 
we and certainly with the water project coming up I think once we've once we've completed our match day travel um plan I think we'll be able to reevaluate that and understand where we've got to at that point so yes I think there's more we can do in this space but we're open to more the strategy was never launched as a set in stone document and this is what we're doing and we're not changing it we would always adapt to that so if we were constantly analyzing our data and understanding that we're still not making enough change here we would be working on projects to do that so that's engaging with for example our building management and um, facilities management teams as well um, and so I think that there's a lot more we can do in this I think the homegrown initiative for us linked to the academy felt right it really felt there was a heart to it I think you I think you run the risk of opening up you know, when our performance, you know, you've got wins and, and losses. Um, I'd, I'd prefer to be celebrating academy achievements, I think, at this stage. But that's not to say that we wouldn't plant trees to celebrate first team performances in future. It's just the initial heart of the project was to the academy. Yeah, no, I, I, you need to you connect it to something that feels feels relevant. Don't you? Um, Another question uh, Simon again has picked up from are we uh, are we all ambitious enough um, fundamental part of this, however, based on what now seems to be daily events around us, how big a threat do you see security in inverted commas be it cyber energy material supply or physical infrastructures in achieving key sustainability goals. Maybe that also links on a bit to supply chain and how you engage with suppliers, the right suppliers, suppliers aligned to, uh, you know, not just this the security issue, but enabling you to deliver on your on your sustainability goals. Yes, our legal and procurement teams um, have a new kind of onboarding process for suppliers in the supply chain, and that. Uh, it enables them to do their financial and legal due diligence to ensure that we, we are making the right business decisions in that space. And that sits within our corporate responsibility. So certainly, um, the, for example, if they're looking at a tender process to take on a new supplier, then it's weighted much more heavily in sustainability um, in that scoring process than ever before. And that's been an, an overhaul of our entire um, onboarding process for suppliers and supply chain. And I think that's the key thing for us was the joining up of those departments. They're working in alignment. So our, our legal team and our procurement team have been involved in our staff training on sustainability. They also, for, of course, for example, our supply chain are all um, SIPs qualified. So the Chartered Institute of, of Safe Procurement and Suppliers, they, they are already having kind of obviously their fair trade and modern slavery training and all of that. And so with in, in line with the halo effect and, and the uh, corporate responsibility, they've made sure that in all of their processes, they've gone back and they've reviewed those. And those decisions are a lot more robust now um, than perhaps they might have been before. And in doing that, um, I think that there's always going to be risk, but I think it's a much more managed risk. Um, and our legal and risk teams in general are always reviewing that. And again, with having Tim Greenwell heading up the halo effect as our chief legal and risk officer, it means that he, you know, we're very close to it. You know, he, he's always uh, reviewing and assessing our practices um, to kind of, I guess, eliminate where possible that security risk in that space. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, Question from Ben again, are you following Forest Green Rovers model with Dale Vince? <laughs> I, um, I'm hoping to go and visit Forest Green sometime soon. We were meant to visit and then we went into another lockdown at the time um, because we actually met with um, the chap who looks after their, their, their grounds equipment and things. And uh, he's pr provided us with some samples of things that we can wash down some of our equipment with. It's much more environmentally um, uh, suitable. To, to what we're trying to achieve. And um, I'd like to go and have a look and meet Dell. <laughs> well, they before, actually but, have an organic yeah. pitch there, don't they? Yeah, there's, oh, a, lot, there's a lot we could learn. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think, think, I, I think a lot of clubs could learn a lot from what Forest Green are doing. And uh, yeah. yeah, as soon as I get there for a visit, I'll be um, taking lots of notes. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, 
No, I, I was lucky enough to be uh, to, to be shown around and taken there. But the, um, I think what's interesting is the attitude to like the vegan food. It's like, we're not telling you to be vegan. Just come and try it. You might like it. And I just yeah. think that attitude is like, none of it is forcing it down your throat. It's just like, just come and, and see you might actually like it. And we've seen that in the concourses, you know, we provide vegan sausage rolls and other vegan offerings so that people have a choice. And in our recent match day, well, our recent fan surveys that went out, we've added in questions about dietary requirements, including, you know, vegan offerings and how important that is to people. Um, we're also looking at kind of just the, the, where we're getting our food from. So Gather and Gather, who's our catering provider, um, a key part of um taking them on as a provider is that they have something called the Hampshire Larder, which ensures that um, just a huge amount of what they're serving at the stadium um, comes from Hampshire based providers, you know, local produce. And that's again, sits alongside our sustainability strategy really nicely. And, um, and it's that openness to change and to try. And I think, I think when we tried meat free Mondays at the stadium for staff in the past, and that was before the halo effect, it was before um, we had a strategic approach to sustainability, there, there was kind of real mixed response because people felt that by eliminating all other options and just making Mondays meat free, people felt, I don't have a choice here. And I think there was a good learning in that, in that time because for us, we, we always want to be providing education and engagement around even if you a couple of times a week chose a me free option, there's, these are the benefits and to link that back to the halo effect all the time. And since the halo effect has been launched this year, it provided us with context against which anything that we change or do or propose has something that's the backbone of it. It's, it's linked to this. This is, this is why we're saying we're doing this. And these small changes here will help us achieve this. And I think people now, are a lot more open to trying those things and we have I think there's world vegan month coming up in November and we will have some content about that at the time and again we don't want to be seen saying to Saints fans oh you should be vegan and we're all vegan here at Saints that's certainly not the messaging yeah. we'll be putting out but we want to have a nod to the fact it's vegan month and hey let's yeah. let's see if we could try some of these recipes at home for example you know yeah, yeah. But I'm super conscious of time. We've got one minute left and there's a couple of questions around the net zero game, uh, around if you've considered carbon sequestration at, actually at your grounds and things, carbon credits might just leave that because I would really like you to just, if you can wrap up what your advice might be to local Southampton businesses who either might want to be, uh, you know, supplying you or maybe want to be supplying other businesses. And, and I guess from my side, I would like the message to be, this is going to become a license to operate in the future. And mm -hmm. you just start the journey, but it would be great um, if you would yeah. like to just summarize, like, you, you know, your journey, the start, obviously you've got probably less than a minute now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just just get, get on and do something, you know, that's better than doing nothing. Um, you don't have to have teams of experts in your organization to make a change. You just need to have the want to do it and, and to get started. Um, and also, I think it's important to, to talk about what you're doing. So you bring other people on your journey and you influence others as you go, depending on kind of how, you know, where you're placed and, and your audience. Um, I think oh, there was something I was going to say, and it's gone off the top of my head now. But yeah, there's, there's so much you can do in this space. And it's just being in alignment with what, if anyone wanted to work with us, it would be being in alignment with what we're trying to achieve. So that's what we're looking for now across the whole organisation is people who... Who, uh, who absolutely want the same things as us in this space. So, um, yeah, that's all I would say, I guess. Well, brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your Thank input. You Someone me. did ask if we'd share the presentation, but I think the recording is going to be up on, and all of the recordings of Future South webinars are up on the Future South website. So if you go to the Future South, have a look at events, you'll find the recording there. You can listen to, to Caroline again and, and some of the chat. Thank you for all of your um, input and your feedback and your questions. I hope it has been interesting. Keep following the agenda at Future South. Uh, we've got some great speakers coming up, all sorts of different topics. Um, and, and we're well into the next year of, of uh, topics and things that we'll be putting there. So thank you, Caroline, for your time and uh, inspiration for the businesses in the South and uh, the low carbon agenda. So thanks ever so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone.